when we're studying these passages in Genesis, passages in Genesis, we want to remember that we're trying to accomplish several things. One thing we want to do is we want to study the narrative. We want to know what the storyline is. We want to know what happens. We want to know when it happens. We want to know what happens first and what happens next. So our consideration will be historical. But we also want to know what God is doing in history. What is God's purpose in making this thing happen or keeping this other thing from happening? What are we learning about God when we see, when we study history and we, when we see the lives of these men and women unfold, the good things that happen to them, the hard things which happen to them? And there, our consideration will be theological. The historical question is, what happens? The theological question is, what is God doing? Why does He let that thing happen? And the third question we ask, and this is true when we study any part of the Bible, the third question we ask is, what, how are we responding to God when we see what happens? When we see what He allows? When we learn something about God, when we begin to know His attributes, what is He like? in His works? What does He do? What is our response? What is the response of our heart? Are we loving God? Are we agreeing with God? Are we making adjustments in what we think is okay to submit to His will? Or are we angry because He's not doing what we would have done if we had been God? So our consideration there is spiritual. What happens in the narrative, in the storyline, that's the historical consideration. What does it mean about God? That's the theological consideration. How do we respond to God? That's the spiritual consideration. But there's one more consideration. After we think about the history and the theology and our own response to God, the spiritual reality in our lives, what do we do? What do we change? What's going to be different now that we know about God and we know what God has done and we begin to learn why He did it and we, we begin to worship Him and, and we long to know Him better? That's the practical application, the practical consideration, the way that our time with the Word of God, our time with, with Holy Scripture is, is going to change us. And so we see uh, already in this situation, we see a bit of romance. Jacob has fallen in love. Evidently, the girl loves him. A horrible act of deceit and trickery on the part of, of Laban. But now we're asking ourselves, okay, what is God doing? Why did this happen? Why did God allow this to happen? Well, and again, I think we talked about this earlier in Genesis 29, but we'll just say it again so we be sure we get the point before we move on. There is something that Paul talks about in Galatians 6. It's called sowing and reaping. If you drop wheat into the ground, wheat comes out of the ground. That's true in the natural universe. But it's also true in the supernatural universe. It's also true in our supernatural or spiritual lives. And what that means is this, if we deceive someone, we're sowing something, we're planting something. There will be a harvest one day, and the harvest is that we will be deceived. Jesus said it in a different way. He said, those who take up the sword, those who live by the sword, will die by the sword. So what did Jacob do? He deceived his father. That's what he sowed. That's what he sowed. So what does Jacob reap? Well, he was deceived by his father-in-law. That's fair, isn't it? If Jacob is going to live a life of deception, if deception is okay, then why isn't it okay for Jacob to be deceived since he deceived his father-in-law, his father Isaac? Isaac was blind. Isaac couldn't see. Everything was dark to him. Well, at midnight after the wedding party, when he's drunk and there's no lights on, now he can't see anything. 
In other words, that wedding night came when Jacob was in the same position as Isaac. Isaac couldn't tell the difference between the two brothers. Now Jacob can't tell the difference between the two sisters. You see what's happening. And um, Esau was the older brother. So by right and by law, even though God was going to overrule it, Esau should have, been, have preferred first. But Jacob came in and put himself, the younger, in front of the older. Well, in marrying the little sister first, he was trying to do that again. But his father-in-law said, no, 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 we don't do that where we live. The older comes first. Let me just tell you, when you study the whole book of Genesis, from this part of Genesis to the end of Genesis, there's probably nobody in the Bible who shows us the law of sowing and reaping like Jacob. It's going to happen again. This is not the last time we will see it. We will see it again in his life. Now, so we see how God sovereignly overrules or uses the wicked thing that Laban did to bring a righteous application to Jacob's life. You see, there are some believers who can't learn just by teaching or just by sitting in a classroom. God wants to teach us lessons by sitting in a classroom and hearing His Word taught. But the reality is that many of us Christians, we're not really going to learn the lesson that way. We're not going to heed the warning just because a Bible teacher tells us about the warning. We're only going to learn if we do something that God says not to and we suffer for it. And then we see the reason God was trying to protect us by warning us and, and commanding us. This is the way Jacob learns, and he's going to learn the lesson over and over and over. Now there's something else in chapter 29, and it's hard. And we see it in many places in the Old Testament, and it is this business of polygamy. You know what I mean by polygamy. Polygamy is when a man is married to more than one woman. That's polygamy. There are some people in history, uh, Mormons for instance, who try to argue that uh, marrying more than one person is okay because we see it in the Bible. Well, let me just say that there's a great, great difference in what God allows and what God commands. There's a great, great difference in what God might use and what God prefers or what God really wants, what God desires. And it's very, very clear when we read the whole Bible that polygamy is never God's first choice, even though He allows it and He may use it. When we read the Bible, God is taking the children of Israel to school. And in these early books of the Old Testament, the children of Israel are in kindergarten. They're in, they're in first grade. And you know, there are things which are allowed in kindergarten and in first grade which are not allowed in university. By the time we get to the New Testament, by the time we get to the generation of the Lord Jesus Christ, the children of Israel were in the university. Now, most of them fail that course, and they prefer to be in kindergarten than to learn the high spiritual lessons which Jesus was bringing to them. But we can find these episodes in the Old Testament and they can amaze us, and it's very wrong to say, well, it must be okay then. No, it's not okay. And by the way, by the time you get even to the book of Leviticus, Leviticus 18.18, 18, there's a command that even though a man may be marrying more than one woman, he was never to marry two sisters, never. If the first sister was alive, you never married the second sister. And so this is not what God wants. This is something that happened, but it's not what God wants. Now, when we first came together, we talked about the fact that in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, events are dominant. 
things which happen, creation, the fall, the first marriage, the first murder, the flood, the judgment at the Tower of Babel, these are great events. But beginning in chapter 12 and going to the end of the whole Bible, not just Genesis 12 to Genesis 50, but Genesis 12 to Revelation 22, the whole Bible is about one man's family. That man is Abraham. And we as Christian believers are spiritual children of Abraham too. We're in Abraham's family also by faith. Abraham is our father, unless we're Jews, not our physical father, but our spiritual father. Well, here's a surprising thing to learn, and it's a hard thing to learn. The family's messed up. The family's really messed up. And we're starting to see that in the very beginning, in the generation of Abraham's grandsons. We're seeing how really, really, really messed up Abraham's family is. And yet God's going to use that family. God's going to bless that family. God's going to exalt that family. God's going to overrule and overwhelm the great problems and sins in that family. We have this kind of psychological word in, in English. I don't know if you use it very much in Russian. Thirty years ago, we never used it in English. Now we use it all the time. It's called dysfunctional. Dysfunctional. It means it doesn't work. And we talk about a dysfunctional family. What that means is that family doesn't work. That family's not doing what a family's supposed to do. Well, most families are dysfunctional, especially apart from grace. The really hard things we face in life are, are, are the things that come from our family. And uh, this family is really, really dysfunctional. And in chapters 29 and 30 and 31, 32, 33, 34, this is the part of Genesis where we really see it. In a way, it gets worse when we come to the generation of Joseph. But we can really, really see the hard things beginning to happen right now. And by the time we get to the end of Genesis 29, Jacob has got two wives. He starts out with one girlfriend, and all he wants to do is marry her. And just like that, he, not only, he no longer has one girlfriend, he's got two wives, and he doesn't even want one of them. He's also got a job he doesn't want, because now he's got to stay seven years longer. That's what kind of bad guy Laban was. Laban makes a deal. You work seven years from my daughter. Jacob says, great. Then he gives him the wrong daughter. And Laban says, oh, I meant seven years for the older daughter. Now you got to work seven more years for the daughter you really wanted. That's what kind of man Laban is. But remember, that's the way Jacob treated his father. That's the way Jacob treated his brother. And now he sees what it feels like. Now his father-in-law is treating him like that. Now he's got a wife that he really doesn't want. While we continue being a benevolent project, your kind donations will continue to be vital in fulfilling the calling of TVS ministry. We do count on your gracious support and cooperation. For detailed information, please visit tvsseminary.com. Well, we talked about how God's sovereignty overruled Laban's sin. Now look at the end of chapter 29. In chapter 29, verse 31, it says that God, God knows that Leah is not loved, but He gives her a baby first. He gives her a baby before He gives Rachel a baby. As a matter of fact, He gives Leah four sons before Rachel has any children. Now, verse 32 says the first son is named Reuben. I'll just mention this right now. The first son of Jacob is named Reuben. The name Reuben means behold a son. The B-E-N, Ben, that's son. Reuben, behold a son. The last son of Jacob is named Benjamin. Benjamin means the son of my right hand. You hear the 
you hear the syllable again, don't you? Ben, Ru Ben, Ben Jamun. Ben means sun. Reuben means look at the sun. Benjamin means the son of my right hand. God is sending us a message. He's sending us a message through the sons of Jacob. These are the patriarchs, the first fathers. These are the ones for whom the tribes of Israel are named. In the names of the patriarch, the names of the sons of Jacob, the names of the tribes of Israel, here's what God is saying. Look at the son, the son of my right hand. Remember when we first started studying Genesis, I tell you the most important thing to understand about the Old Testament is that it all points to Jesus. Look at the Son. Who is the Son? He's the Son of my right hand. Who is that? That's Jesus Christ, our Lord. So this firstborn son is named Reuben. The secondborn son is named Simeon. The thirdborn son is named Levi. And the fourth-born son is named Judah. She has four sons, and she stops having children. Rachel still doesn't have any children. And we've reached the end of Genesis 29. Now, the great drama continues in chapter 30. <clears throat> 